today, and you obviously probably can figure it out why, um, but we'll get cranked up, and here we'll make a couple announcements shortly. But I want to open with uh, the Word as we open the new year, and as we open another day of service together, worship together, and then we'll pray and continue with service after that. So this is found in Isaiah 55, uh, familiar verses to a lot of you probably. Isaiah 55, 6 through 11 says this, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty or void but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, without your word, without your presence, without your spirit, without your son, we'd have, we'd have no hope, but we'd also have no reason. God, we'd be doomed and we'd be wallowing in our doom. God, even those that don't recognize you are blessed by the presence of you. We thank you for that. We thank you that this morning we can gather in this place, a place that is dry. God, it's warm. And Father, as much as we can tell, it's safe. We know that many across the world can't say that as they gather today, but they gather the same. So we thank you, Lord, that we get to join in that rich tradition of people that are called your church. God, you call us your people. You call us into covenant with you. And as I saw again in your word this morning, you got your covenant with your people. And I thank you for that. So God, we come today to celebrate you. God, we thank you for a new year. We thank you for friends. We thank you for the church. But God, we come here to worship you. For you alone are holy, 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 as declared by your prophet. And so, Father, would you be glorified in every word that we say, God, every thought that we have, every plan that may cross our mind as we listen today, every word that we sing, God, would it be honorable to you? And Lord, we thank you for your promise. Lord, you tell us that you inhabit the praises of your people. And so, God, we praise you. We praise you because you're here, and we praise you because we want you to be here. So thank you, Father, for your truths. God, be glorified in our midst today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we're going to open with hymn number 111. <laughs>
a couple announcements this morning. Uh, first, as you came in today, you saw, and I sent an email out, so I hope you saw that for some preparation. There should be communion cups with the bread and the juice together when you walk in. So if you didn't grab that, if you go ahead and get that here in the next few minutes, because we're going to celebrate that right after our prayer time today. And we're just doing this to be cautious with all the germs and all the virus and everything else going on. And so that's a good segue into that conversation. Um, so obviously this thing has been going on for two years now. We kind of know. I feel like we're professionals at this, unfortunately, at this point. <laughs> Uh, here's the stance we're going to take. There is no stance. Uh, the, if the government wants to make a statement on what they're going to do, we'll obey like we did last time. But as of right now, the church is not going to make a position. The church is not going to take a stance on things. But here's what I'm begging and asking. We have done this so well over the last two years. Let's continue to do it. There will be people that agree differently than you. Uh, there will be people that have differences of opinion. There will be levels of comfort. Some of us are... Don't care at all, and some of us have a little more hesitancy. Let's honor the Lord by showing grace one to another. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a difference of opinions. And so if you need to separate out, please feel free to separate out. If you want to offend me, and if you offend somebody else, they can grow up sometimes later. And so just feel free to separate out if you need to. If you need to wear a mask, please feel free to wear a mask. There are a lot of people not here today because they were either exposed to COVID. There are several in our, our community, our family, that have COVID. Nothing serious at this point. Uh, but please, let's just so grace. I'm reading a book right now called Until Unity by Francis Chan. It's a good one. And it just talks about the promise that God gives us when his people are unified. And the promise is this, that the world will know that Jesus the Son was sent to save them by how his people are unified. Mm -hmm. Nothing has divided this world in the past 50 years the way COVID has. And let our church be stand strong in Amen. unity the way we show grace for one to another. Thank you for being that. Let's continue to be that as we move forward. Also, I want to remind you guys that next Sunday, right after service, there will be a special call business meeting um, after the service to vote on the 2022 church officers and leaders. I'm sorry I didn't have it last week, but the roster is in the back. So if you want to take one of those and pray through that, uh, please today remember to take uh, the poinsettias. Um, if you have any of those left, there are calendars in the back for you to take those as well. Let me clarify some things about prayer. Uh, Gary Del Greco, Melissa Gavello's father, came home. And so praise the Lord, he's home and back with his family. I talked to Deb Watson yesterday. She is positive for COVID, uh, but we all know Deb. She's a trooper. She beat that thing down. <laughs> and uh, So she was better in two days. And uh, but she's still staying away just to be smart and wise. And um, Mary, how's, how's Barb? Do we have another? Well, Barbara is the wife of yeah. Tony. Uh, Tony just passed away on Friday. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and that was probably a blessing because he would have had severe brain damage. Mm -hmm. So we pray. So he's passed. Yes, ma'am. But he's a believer. So let's celebrate Tony being home with the Lord, and then let's pray for Barb as she transitions and grieves as a widow um, through all of that. <clears throat> um, so you have your communion cups, and we'll go right into that. And I'll make another announcement if you won't like this, and so you can hide if you'd like. Um, and these are beautiful, but they're not sufficient, and all of you agree. Uh, Carol Noyes has served faithfully to this church. I, I don't even know what the number is anymore. I'm sure you know it to the day. 30? <laughs> 40? Three, no, three months short of 45 years. Three months short of 45 years. Every, yep. Everyone in this room has been here longer than I have, but for the two years that I've been here, and it's two years, like right now, yeah. two years. <laughs> Since two years that I have been here, this woman and her husband have been an absolute blessing to me. Uh, you have been friends. Um, you have been prayer warriors. It has been a joy uh, to call you brother and sister. I've watched God do incredible things in both of our lives as he brought us together to pray through stuff. So I'm thankful for you, period. I'm also thankful for you for keeping me straight and uh, for all the things that you've done to serve the kingdom by serving this church. We love you, and we are thankful for you. So it's thank been you. an honor and a privilege. Thank you. That yeah, goes from all of us. Bro. Yes. Yeah. I was waiting. I knew Tom she's would have some. She's a blessing <laughs> to all of us. Part of that blessing is she doesn't like being called up front, so we'll leave her off the hook now. <laughs> Thank you for that so much. But let's do go into a time of, of prayer and worship this morning um, to kind of have a smoother transition. Uh, we sometimes stop and take a moment to give praise to the Lord in the middle of a season where things are so incredibly difficult. Uh, let's take an opportunity to give praises to God for things that you see him doing in our life right now. Um, we're just praising for his goodness. Anything that you would like to share out loud this morning? I want to pray for our government. They're so divided right now. They need to work together. Amen. Let's do pray for our government. Amen. Back. I want to pray for, um, there's a young mom that thanks to someone in this church was able to help her out, but to 
other churches and people have helped her out that will be moving into her new home tomorrow with her newborn baby, with her two other children, and I am just um, so proud and pleased that we were able to help with that. And uh, it's, I, I, the work goes on. <laughs> If you didn't notice, that's true. That's true. If you didn't notice, there's a family back today. Uh, Mike is here, and he still has his beard, much to my joy. <laughs> so the Sullivans are back with us today. They've gotten to spend time with their family. Uh, I think all of us have missed them, uh, and we're praying for safe travel. So do you guys leave tomorrow? Today, tomorrow. Leave it for us to doing the whole thing again. Yeah. Okay. So pray for them as they travel. It'll be wet this part. Hopefully, it'll dry as they get back to <laughs> Arkansas. Yeah. Uh, and enjoy the heat. It's probably 80 degrees there. 13. It's what? 13. All oh, right, their Arkansas is broken. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got their northern Arkansas, they're not towards Rhode Island. So, so pray for the self. It, it is good to see you guys. Uh, really good to see you. Um, any other praises this morning? Um, I want to praise God for optimism and hope. No. And I have a lot of it. I have a lot of optimism and hope. And from what I'm reading about, you know, the new variant, it seems like the, it could point to the end of this. Could. It could. Yeah. And I have a lot of optimism and hope, and I, I attribute that a lot to you, because you give us things to look forward to, and and you give us hope that, uh, you know, that things may get better. Maybe we have to endure a little bit of at first, but I do believe that things will get better, and I do see um, some good news on the horizon, and um, and I, I hope I'm right. But even if I'm not, I will still always have hope. And optimism that um, that things will get better. Thank you. Mark? Travel mercies for myself and my sister. Okay. Um, I'm driving to Florida on Thursday. My sister's flying on Monday. We're going to see our sister and brother in Florida. So I'm hoping it'll be. <laughs> Not 13 degrees. So it'll be my sister. So just travel mercies for both of us. You got it. I guess I'll piggyback on that. I thought, oh, I can't wait to so I'm from Michigan. I'm originally from New Jersey. A lot of you have met me before. And I didn't know if I was going to be able to be here with her and with all of you today because there were thousands of flights getting canceled uh, right beforehand. But um, every time I checked my phone, which was every 10 minutes, to see if my flight was still on schedule to come here, it was. And I, the Lord woke me up at 4 o'clock in the morning on Wednesday and said, pack your things right now. <laughs> and so I'm thankful I got here with no problems. And I fly back out tomorrow at 10 a.m. And so far that's not canceled because I need to return home to my busy family. So uh, prayers for that. And just thankful to be here with everybody. Mm. Well, glad to hear Lisa. So pray for Lisa. She travels tomorrow, please. <laughs> Um, yes, ma'am. Thank God for for the Lord's bring us bringing you so about the respiratory um, congestion. And yes. and he did have COVID, took two tests, and then as soon as he got better, uh, we had to have three root canal stones. Uh -huh. yeah, the next day, or in, the, day in the next chapter. <laughs> Still working through Mike. We are thankful for you. Pray for another Mike too. Mike Conroy or Mike Ventura is going through it, guys. He's been going through it for two years. Uh, we're just asking that the Lord would stay and that He would hold their appointment on the sixth for his next surgery. Uh, this, this is a this is a big one. Uh, nothing that Mike has had in the last two years has been easy, and so we're just praying that the God would protect and bless our brother and sister as they walk through this. And before we pray this morning, I just want to thank God that He continues to raise up new friends. And other people, I met William this past week. Uh, William's here with us worshiping this morning. Uh, it's always good to meet a brother. And, uh, and I'm thankful for William. We had an opportunity to pray together several times. Uh, he walked through this place this morning just praying that God's blessings would fall in this room. So thank you, William, for being with us. Uh, thank you for your friendship. And I look forward to a long time longer. So thanks, buddy. Would anybody be willing to open us this morning as we pray? And then after that, we're going to close in the Lord's Prayer. Um, and we'll go directly into our time of communion after that. Does anybody want to open us this morning? All right, Mike, if you'd open us, that'd be great. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for all this, Lord. Um, for the new year that's coming, Lord, uh, we ask for new beginnings, uh, and all new uh, people to change their hearts in a new way. Uh, so you, Lord, Lord, um, just uh, have so much to bring forward to you, Lord. Happening on a daily basis. Uh, as Bonnie mentioned, the COVID and uh, all of us, uh, we, we have loved ones and friends that are uh, 
Lord God, I just thank you for Pastor. Thank you for Pastor Brock and his family, Lord God, and that your family protect them over them each day and the Father God. Keep them safe in this COVID and uh, just keep them all healthy. And I praise you, God, for those who have traveled here over the holidays, the Sullivans who made that long trek, and my daughter Lisa, Heavenly Father God. I just thank you, Lord, for the safe travel that you provided. And I pray for safe travel as they leave to go home again and or their, their own communities, Lord. I, I thank you for your salvation. I thank you for, for, for all the blessings that I've had in my life, very abundantly blessed. I pray for my friend Barbara now. Uh, it's very difficult to lose a spouse, especially so suddenly, Lord, and at the holidays for Barbara. She, she loves you, Lord, and she knows where Tony is. But it's still, you know, it's gonna be a comfort for her to have believers around her, her church. So just comfort her, Lord, with your angels around her. She faces a funeral and all kinds of arrangements for Tony. And uh, just thank you ahead of time, in Jesus' name. Amen.
come to an agreement, compromise. Compromise is at the heart of any good relationship, marriage, friendship, and so on. So let that be the goal, I think, so that we would just keep sensational news at bay and that we wouldn't uh, be attracted to that ourselves, perhaps, because sometimes our flesh wants to hear negative things. But that's not what you call us to do. You call us to be a light in the world to help us to desire that glory, not only to desire it, but to be it. Lord, I thank you for this day. Even though it's raining and we're complaining, Lord, we know that you give us exactly what we need. And Lord, I thank you for this church and the church family. I also, Father, think back on this past year and how many prayers you have answered for us. Lord, help us to keep that in mind, that you do answer prayer, and some very <clears throat> miraculously. And we need to remember that and to keep you close in our hearts and ears. Because you are listening, Lord, and we thank you so much for that. <coughs> Father, I thank you for, <clears throat> for you. We praise you. We live in a lost, <clears throat> dying, <coughs> and dead world. And God, everything the world tells us is helpful, is heart hurtful. It's fleeting. God, all we have is you. And I thank you that you are consistent and you are firm. I thank you, Lord, that you deal with your people, that you come into our presence and you show us your goodness because it's your goodness that we need. I thank you, Father, that any hope built on anything less is foolishness. But the hope of your people who you've called in the covenant with you is built on Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And Lord, we celebrate that this morning. I thank you that we have a message to proclaim. God, as we do listen to the leaders of this land and of every other land waffle back and forth, <clears throat> argue and bicker. I thank you, Father, that you are always firm. And that you declare that your way is right and every other one is wrong. And that those of us who have chosen wrong, you sent your son to redeem us back to right relationship with you. And we praise you. But we don't deserve that. We could never earn that. And we thank you that it is far beyond our understanding. But God, we tell you, we want it. We want it all. And so Lord, would you be glorified in our midst today? I thank you for my friends in this room and that can't be in this room today. God, for all those that are struggling through this virus or exposure to this virus, I pray for those that are sick that you would touch and heal their bodies. Only you could. God, I pray for those that have been exposed to this virus, God, that you would put a hedge of protection even after the fact. Only you can go back in time. So, Father, I pray that you would be glorified by protecting them. God, I pray for today, <clears throat> for those that are traveling, either today or soon. I pray for the Sullivans. I thank you for their friendship. I thank you that they got time to spend with family. God, I thank you that we get to see their faces and where we get to send them off with your prayers again. God, sending them this time won't be any more fun or any easier than it was last time. Lord, we thank you that this time we know that they go to a home that they love. And we thank you, Father, we pray that you'd give them good weather, that the roads would be safe. God, that you would give them eyes to see, to drive, protect them from others that who aren't paying attention. I pray the same for Marcy as she sets out for Florida, and I pray for Doris as she flies. I pray that they would get there to spend time with family, and it would be a sweet, sweet time. Thank you for Lisa. Thank you, Lord, that she could make her trip, be with her family, be with her mom. Thank you that she could be with us. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would bless her as she travels back. And this next flight, God, when thousands are being canceled, would you hold hers? Mm -hmm. And I pray, Lord, that it would make and that her luggage would get there on time. Lord, she would get back to her family and it would be sweet. God, I thank you for this family. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to stand in opposition to disunity. Mm -hmm. God, the world wants us to be at war. Mm -hmm. The world wants us to believe things, and we will. But Lord, I pray that your unity would be far more important than our opinions. I pray, Lord, as we see brothers and sisters through masks or unmasked, or God, as we hear coughs, or God, we hear reports, or we're frustrated or let down or hurt by others, God, I pray that we would stand for unity. God, not for our sake, but so that the world might know that you sent your son that they might be saved. God, I thank you for my friend Carol and Mark today. 
I thank you for them in the midst of many who serve you faithfully. God, we celebrate you for giving us Carol and Mark. God, what a gift they are to us and they're every other person in this room. I thank you for calling us together as the church, some the hand, some the foot. God, you are the head and we serve under you gladly. So I thank you for the privilege of serving you and serving alongside others. God, we come together today and we pray that you would prepare our hearts to not only hear your word, but to take part in what it tells us to do in the way that we pray and in the way that we celebrate your, your covenant with us by celebrating this communion. So God, prepare our hearts and give us a glimpse into what you see. God, we think of Isaiah and when he walked into your presence. God, he didn't say thank you. He didn't ask you for something. He just, woe is me, a man of unclean lips. God, your presence exposes things. So would you expose in us what needs to be exposed today, that we can walk rightly with you. Thank you for teaching us to pray. We pray our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. bit of a curveball, not much though. Uh, Joe and Joy, I'm going to ask you guys for, for communion today. Can we sing your first song, celebrate communion in the middle, and then sing your second song after that? So would you leave us an amazing love now, and then we'll do communion after that. <clears throat> that you brought me out of and where I am now and I am blessed because of you because you died and because all that you did and suffered so that I may have this life with you in Jesus name I thank you
but it's to obey him. And it's to worship him through obedience. And one of the blessings of obedience that we get is to celebrate in the communion together. Think about throughout history, people that have been called his disciples, his followers, his people, have gathered with him and sung his praises, declaring his kingship to them. A very long time ago, there were 12 men that sat around the table with him and they shared a meal. An incredible night. Think about all the things that they saw Jesus do. They not only heard his teaching and his preaching and heard his laughter and heard his stories and what he was looking forward to and what the Passover meant to him, the one who truly understood the Passover. They would eventually see him take off his outer garment and strap on a towel around his waist and go to their dirty, dust-ridden street feet and wipe the dust off, wearing it upon himself. Later, he would take a piece of bread, just a piece of bread, but he would give that bread great significance. And he would open the, hold that bread up in the air and he would tear it into pieces. And he said, in the same way, my body is broken for you. To eat it in remembrance of me. This morning, before we do that, I'm going to ask my buddy Ned, Ned, would you thank our Lord for the broken body in celebration of taking the bread? I'm going to pass that privilege over to Mark Lloyd. Huh? Let's all bow our heads for that. Father, we thank you that you were able to come this morning. You've given us another beautiful day, another um, a day that you have made. We bring ourselves before your table, as was done many, many years ago. And we are told about the kingdom of God. And that uh, all we need to do is lay our lives before you. And it is ours. And Father, the, the symbolic nature of this bread is that the, the, uh, the body of Christ, the Son of God, was broken so that each one of us may take it and come even closer. Yeah. And as we take of this bread, let us thank you for all that you've given to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So take and eat in remembrance of him. As if that weren't enough. He washed their feet. He washes our dirt as well. His body was punished for us. No movie that you've seen that ever pictured the crucifixion or the whipping or the beatings or the slaps and the punches can ever do justice to what Jesus endured. But he didn't just suffer. He bled too. And he bled out. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And not by the blood of bulls and goats are you brought back into a relationship with the Father, but through the shedding of the blood of the Son. Let's thank God for the cup. Father, we thank you. No words are sufficient. And so we just declare your words back to you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We thank you for this blood. Remind us now and as we go through the rest of this day and this week and for the rest of our lives that we are your children because you chose to wash us with your blood. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I often say at this time and on that night they sang a hymn and they left. We're going to sing a song and we're going to stay. Some of us are going to stay. There's peace for our transgressions, he's got us for our sins. Understand the Lord of peace, Lord of all things.
to us that seems like nothing but in that time it was gigantic and very quickly after they started construction on this what was going to be an eight-story building they were about to the first or second floor they noticed the problem they started to notice that there was groundwater underneath them and a lot of mud and a lot of sand and they noticed this not because they dug but because the building started to lean just a slight lean at first and it was tilting off to the north obviously someone had not done their homework the Bible tells us, and every good engineer and every person that's ever built anything, if they did their work first, you know that first you're supposed to check the foundation before you do anything. And there were clearly foundation issues. They could have stopped, but they didn't. They could have said, no, we're going to move this building and put it in another place, or we're going to do the necessary foundation work, but that's not what they did. So as the building tilts off to the north, instead they decide to go to the other side and to make those floors and those ceilings and those walls just a little bit thicker to make it appear that all things were okay. So this side was thicker than this side to have the appearance that all things were right. But it wasn't right. Then suddenly political unrest in Italy came about. And for 100 years, nobody went to that tower. Nobody walked near it, nobody worked on it. It just sat there incomplete, leaning more and more and more. In the year 1272, construction resumed. But this time, the building, the tower, wasn't leaning north. It had leaned back the other way and was now leaning much further to the south. By the mid-1300s, the eighth level had been added and the building was complete. They even put a bell tower on top. But they didn't put the bell tower where the bell tower belongs. It wasn't dead center with the bell in the center of the structure. Instead, it was off-centered, far to the left, so that it would make the appearance that all things were okay. Open for business because things look right. And for hundreds of years, people came and celebrated the Leaning Tower of Pisa. They walked in, they took tours, but then in 1989, something happened. A neighboring tower collapsed because of the same foundational issues, and they called on it and said, we probably should not let people in this Leaning Tower any longer. So they shut it down to the public. They bought it, they brought in all the big brains, all the engineers, all the money, all the plans, all the ideas. And they drove into the core, and they rammed rods and spikes and everything else that you would do to try to straighten up the foundation. You want to know something? It worked, sort of. And in 2001, they realized we moved this thing back a whole 44 centimeters. 
17 inches, tilted back towards center. And at that point, they declared, she's good. It's safe. In 2001, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, still leaning much more so at this point, was declared safe, open for visitation, because they said this, she'll stand for 200 more years at least. She'll stand. Off-center, built incorrectly, broken foundation, but she'll stand. But the final outcome will be a collapse. All of that time, all of that work, all of that effort, all of her fame and claim, every tourist that's walked in that building, and one day the outcome will be the collapsed Tower of Pisa, all because of a bad foundation. People are like buildings. All of us are built on foundations as well. Your foundation is your family. Your foundation is where you grew up. Your foundation is your memories. We all have many, many foundations that we build upon. As a people here in this room today, we are people called out by the Lord into a relationship with Christ. We are people called unto himself, the church. And churches are built on a foundation too. And our foundation affects everything. There's a promise for churches, for people truly washed by the blood of Christ. There will be no collapse. Nothing will overcome the church. She will not fall. She will stand. But she can grow crooked. She can stand tilted. And we too can build upon the wrong foundations. And the truth is, is it's not my job to tell you, and it's your, not your job to tell me at this point first that that's occurring. <laughs> But wisdom tells us all to revisit our foundation from time to time. And so for the next few months, as a church body, we're going to revisit our foundations. We're going to look at the core things of Christianity that make us Christians. The things that we hold near and dear, or should hold near and dear as the followers of Christ, as the disciples of the Lord. Revisiting these foundations to make sure that not only are we building rightly upon the right foundation, but we're building true and straight so that we can really be true and straight, not just appearing that way. This will likely cause all of us at some point some discomfort. Never has anyone encountered the Word of God and been completely comfortable in it. Every one of us will have to correct something. Every one of us. But we must do this if we're going to avoid devastation and instability. It's crucial and it's worth it for us to revisit our foundation. Today, as we start this, we're going to look first at the Bible, the scriptures. What are they? What do they do? So before we do that, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. God, no man is wise enough to dissect your word. No man. No group of men and women and boys and girls can collectively be wise enough to understand your word. God, many have tried Many have gotten degrees upon degrees and been raised in the right families and gone to the right schools thinking that they know. But God, you called them broods of vipers. You called them dead men, whitewashed tombs. And so God, protect us from being like them. We don't know your word because we study it. We know your word because you reveal it. And God, as we study it, you make it alive. And through your spirit, you plant it within us. And God, that's what we beg today. So would you open our eyes, truly open our eyes, and let us behold wondrous things from your law. For our good and your eternal glory. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Three kind of parts to this today. The first one is the basics and the brief history of how we got the Bible. You've heard this before. 66 books. 40 different authors, written over 1,500 years. Many books and many letters collected into what we call one book, the Bible. One book that has one congruent story, all pointing towards one thing and one outcome, starting at the very beginning book and wrapping in all the letters and all the other things. One story. Divided into two major covenants, two testaments, the Old and the New. The Old Testament was written and accepted by our faith fathers, the Jews. It was accepted by them. 
When I tell you with full integrity that no book has ever been watched over and cared for like the Word of God, I say that with full integrity. The Jews would have teams and teams of people as they copied down the Old Testament. And if there was even one margin of error, they would burn it to make sure that it didn't last. And then after it went through that perfect thing of watching the scribes write it, they would pass it on to another group of scribes who would go over it just to make sure that, that nobody inserted anything that didn't belong there. They were tedious in protection of this copied down word. They passed it on, and Jesus affirmed it in his words and in his teaching and his ministry. And that's why we hold that the Old Testament is truly the word of God. Rather than being divided out entirely in the way that the events occurred chronologically, which you've heard that word a lot, the Old Testament was laid out by genre or type of writing. The law first, then the history, then the poetry, then the prophecy. These 39, speak, 39 books speak of creation of everyone and everything, and their rebellion against their creator. And then the gist of the story is his plan to redeem them back to himself and the promise of one who would one day come to put all things right. 27 books of the New Testament are divided up the same way. Not in chronological order, but divided out in the types of literature they are. The writing or history, letters, and then prophecy. They focus on the arrival of the promised one. He's come. The Gospels. He's arrived. His ministry on earth, how salvation is offered through him, and how he calls the people unto himself and calls them his beloved, his bride, the church. All leading up one day to the eventual defeat of the enemy, the judgment of every single person, living and the dead, and the promise of eternity for everyone. An eternity of paradise for some, an eternity of condemnation and wrath for those that deny Jesus as Lord and Savior. These 66 books were not just randomly selected. So many throughout history have just said, oh, were they just drawn out of a hat? No. A lot went into this. As I said, the Old Testament was accepted by Jesus. He preached and taught it. And I think that's probably the strongest of tests. In the New Testament, there was a, a way that they did this, where there were men that were set apart by the Holy Spirit through much prayer and confidence in God. They gathered together in a council and through the leading of the Lord, they said, if one of these books that we walk through does not meet all of these characteristics, then we know that it is not of the Lord. And here are the three tests that all of them had to meet. One, was it tied to an apostle? Did an apostle write it? Or was an apostle closely associated with its writing? Not just somebody out there just writing a book for fame and claim. Did one of Jesus' hand-picked leaders write this book? Or was one of their disciples the author? Two, the test of antiquity. Have the people of God, the covenant people, recognized this work throughout history? Have they accepted it as God's words to men? And then the most important, does it conform to the rule of faith? Is the message consistent with every message that we read from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, Judges, Joshua, all the way through? Is the message consistent? If it's not consistent, it's not of God. And there were many books that were thrown out. You've heard of their names. And many people want to throw things up and say, well, why this one? Why did it not make it? And that's your answer. They were careful, faithful to the task. But please don't be confused. The Bible is far more than just a book or a collection of books. The Bible is the Word of God. The Word of God. Every civilization, ours included, and maybe ours mostly, has had an abundance of naysayers on whether or not the Word of God is trustworthy. They ask all sorts of questions. How do we know? Men wrote it. It's so old. How do we know it's true? How do we know it's trustworthy? How do we know it's faithful? And at the end of the day, I can give you all the apologetic answers and tell you all the things and quote all the other books that don't run through this gamut, but here is the true answer. It comes down to faith comes down to faith. Do you believe God, first off? And do you believe that God is able to protect his word to his people as he said he would? And if you don't believe that God can protect his message and his word to his people as he said he would, then you surely cannot believe that God can save you. So if God can't protect his book and his message, he cannot save his people. So it's a faith question.
What is the scripture? What does it do? It is the word of God. And the word is active. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God-breathed is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture. Your favorite passage, that one. The book you hate the most, that one too. The ones that are the easiest to understand, and the ones that are a drudge to walk through, all those names and numbers. All scripture is breathed by God, penned by man, but from the Lord himself. These are his words to his people, penned by his writers. What are they used for? We don't have to guess. Teaching. They're used for teaching us. The beginning of wisdom, the fear, the beginning of fear is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We learn from the word of God. Where do we go for wisdom but the word of God? This is how we learn the ways of the world and the how of the world. How to do the things that we are to do is to be in the word of God. Rebuking something that we hate. But the word of God tells us that he who hates the rebukes of the Lord is a foolish man. I want the rebukes of the Lord. Oftentimes the Father spanks us when we step out of line. And he disciplines those whom he loves. He rebukes us when we step off line. Why? Because he knows the right path is the narrow way. And he rebukes us in that path. His word is used for that. It's used for correct, correcting and training in righteousness. There's so much information in the world. Inundated with it. And it trains us in many things. It seems to correct us in lots of stuff. But only the word of God can train us in righteousness. Only the word of God can do that. Mm -hmm. Why? So that the servant of God, any person that calls himself a Christian, that's your title, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Every good work. Meaning that there is not one thing that any servant of God, any disciple of Jesus can say, that's not my job. Because every good work God prepares us all to do. Is God calling you to? Yes. Every good work he prepares us to do through his word. Which means that if we aren't in his word, we aren't prepared. And we aren't ready to do the work that he has called us to do. And when a king gives his servants a task to do, he doesn't ask for reasons why didn't you do it. It's rebellion and treason if it's not done. And we can only be equipped to do the, work, do the works of God if we live in the word of God. Chuck Swindoll said this, brilliant man. Once scripture is relegated to anything less than the very words of God, all manner of error is certain to follow. As soon as we say this is just a book of morality or the roadmap of life, Anything less than the words of God, error will follow. We could spend the next month in this room, never taking a breath, sharing all the errors that we've seen in our lifetime because people have lessened this to being the word of God. That won't change. It must be the word of God to us because it is the word of God to us. It's the dividing sword. Hebrews 4.12 says this, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. This is frightening stuff. Frightening stuff. It's alive and it's active, meaning that it's breathing like you. It's not an inactive thing that doesn't understand you. It's walked through times in history since there was times in history learning the ways and the methods of men. It knows you. And because the word of God is alive and active and breathing and knows us so well, it exposes us. It exposes lie from truth, fraud from phony. And Jesus speaks of one day, collected in Matthew 25, that one day all those who have ever taken a breath, 
all the living and all the dead will be called up and placed in two lines. And the word of God will call those that are his, his sheep, unto himself. And the word of God will declare those that are his enemies away to condemnation and wrath. The word of God is a divider. It is a dividing sword. That's what it is. The word of God is the standard. It is our final authority. It is our final authority. Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus, quoting Deuteronomy, tempted by the enemy, says this. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. We are to live on and through the word. Live on it. It's our sustenance. It's our diet. It's our hope. And we must live on and through the word of God. Every question or challenge you have finds its answer in the word of God. Our culture may be worse than any other throughout history because it's so easy. I'm having marital problems. Google, what do I do? The word of God. I don't know how to treat this person that's hurt me. I'll go buy a book. The word of God. Every answer, every challenge that we have, why is this happening to me? The word of God. Sitting in a quiet place, you and your master, your savior, begging him to open our minds, show me what it is and why, if you want to, perhaps he doesn't. In your word, why I'm going through this, or what I need to learn, or what's going on. God, speak to me through your word. Show me your word. Answer your prayers. We're to live in the word of God and be people of the book. That's what we are, by the way. You know, for over a thousand years, the way that Muslims have referred to Christians, people of the book. We need to prove them right. If we're known as people of the book, let's be people of the book. And this is actually what sets us apart from every other faith group. Is that our authority is the word of God. Scripture is our authority, not a man. I am not your authority. And I don't want to be. No pastor, no pope, no priest is the authority. The word of God is. It is my authority. It is your authority. We serve our master in his message. This is our authority, his words. No tradition of man, no ways of man. We are people of the book. And one of the most important movements of God's covenant people throughout history, the Reformation, they had solas, things that they said, statements. You've heard a lot of them. Sola gratia, grace alone. Sola fide, faith alone. Solo de gloria, to God alone be the glory. Solo Christ, solus Christus, Christ alone. The sola scriptura, the scriptures alone. And this sets you apart from every other faith group in the world, even many who declare to follow Christ. <clears throat> the scriptures alone are our authority, as they must be. Next, we must understand these things about God's word. It is not going away. In a world where things are fleeting and leaving and disappearing quickly by the day, this is not going away. It will never leave. Matthew 5, 17 through 18, Jesus said this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but I came to fulfill them. Truly, truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, which doesn't happen, not a jot nor a tittle, tittle, not a big part or a little part, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. God's word will not pass away. It is firm and true forever. It's firm and true. And many have tried to destroy it. Many try today. There are missions and organizations and groups and there are people somewhere outside of some church somewhere that are screaming and yelling and chanting, trying to get rid of the word of God. 303 AD, the most powerful man on the planet, the Roman Emperor Diocletian, declared that the Bible should be illegal. And this was because they were in the middle of great persecution against Christians. They were murdering Christians by the tens of thousands. And one Christian, as he stood there ready to have his head chopped off and said, you can kill all of us, 
But if even one Bible remains, it'll all grow back. And he said, then we got to get rid of the Bible. we got to get rid of the Word of God. And in the middle of that great persecution, they took tens of thousands of copies of the Scripture. And for two years, Diocletian made it his task as the most powerful man on the planet to rid the world of the Word of God. And after two years, he stood in a pulpit like this one. And instead of looking over pews, he looked over a gigantic heap of ashes, of burned copies of the Word of God. And he said, I declare the Word of God, the Bible, extinct. Twenty years later, the next emperor, Constantine, stood in a different pulpit, holding his copy, declaring, this word of God is the infallible truth for all men. It's not going away. It always accomplishes its task. Keep preaching it. Keep teaching it. Keep sharing it. Hold on to it. It will always accomplish its task. It's what I read this morning. Thus says the Lord, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that the yield seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that it goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me void, but will accomplish what I desire and it will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And what is the purpose that he sent it? To teach, rebuke, train, righteousness, to call men, women, boys, and girls unto repentance. It will accomplish that task. The Word of God tells us that people cannot know without hearing the message. Preach the message. Teach the message. Share the message. What if they want to hear it? Share it anyway. What if they threaten my life? Share it anyway. Could you be all quicker and closer to the one who gave it to us in the first place? Share the Word of God. It will accomplish its task. It's indescribably powerful. There's so many examples of how powerful it is. We could go through this room and share testimony after testimony of how the Word of God has spoken and challenged you throughout history. My own story is I sat in a cabin in Mississippi when I was 22 years old. After hearing the gospel again from my grandparents, not knowing what in the world was going on with my life, but I knew something big was happening. I didn't know his name yet. And I opened up this word, which was familiar to me academically. And I got to the book of Jonah, and I got to Jonah 2. And I read the words of God, and it was like a hammer to my chest. And it changed my life. And only the power of God could have changed that sinner that I knew so well. Countless examples of throughout history. It is creating and condemning. It has given life, and it has taken life. It heals the sick, and it seals the faint. God's word is beyond comparison. Nothing is like it. It's beyond understanding. God's word is not to be toyed with, for it is dangerous for the mocker and for the believer. For the mocker or anyone foolish enough to deny him or to be arrogant enough to change his message. And this predominantly goes to people like me, who stand in his pulpit behind his word declaring a message, far be it from us, to change what it says. You should call those men and leaders out to change the word of God. Here's more importantly what you need to know. God will deal with them. God will deal with them. And nothing frightens me more than to know that one day that I will stand and that we will all stand with how we handle the word of God. Revelation 22, 19 speaks to the mocker or the one who would be arrogant enough to change his message. If anyone takes words away from the scroll of the prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life in the holy city which are described in this scroll. Word of God. Any person who toys with it and thinks they can alter the message of it, God says, I'll remove your name from the book that matters. Hell, condemnation, and wrath will be yours for all time if you are arrogant enough to disbelieve or to think that it's your job to change the message of God or to make it more palatable, easier, or something else. It's also dangerous to not be toyed with for the believer. We have countless numbers of warnings in the scripture of Christ for Christ followers, telling us how difficult life is going to be. Do you remember the little coincidence that started about two years or a year and a half ago? When I said, I don't know why, but the Lord is leading us to walk through 1 Peter. Then all of a sudden we hear this word called COVID-19, global pandemic, here it comes, get ready. 
And as we walk through 1 Peter, looking at all this persecution and governments imposing and all this difficulty and the crushing of the world and squeezing and we're twisted and turned, and 1 Peter's telling us, yep, this is what's going to happen to believers. It's almost like God knew and told us. And the message for believers and all the warnings in Scripture is that his word is dangerous for you. Revelation 1.9, the Apostle John, one Jesus called Beloved. He said this, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering in the kingdom and patient endurance, endurance that are ours in Jesus, I was on the island of Patmos prison because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And knowing this was, this was only after that they boiled him in boiling oil. They took a vat of boiling oil and dipped the apostle John in it and he survived it. And they said, we can't kill this man, so we better ship him away. And they stuck him on a deserted island by himself. And why was he there? Not because he was a troublemaker, not because he was a thief, not because he was a murderer, not because he was a nuisance, but because of his words, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. It's dangerous. It's not to be toyed with. And then lastly, being a person of the book is dangerous, but this is truly our only hope. After an incredibly hard teaching at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches on taking his body, eating it, and drinking his blood, leading us to the communion of having to celebrate the fact that his body would be broken for his covenant people, his blood would be shared for his covenant people, and if you did not accept that broken body, and if you did not accept that shed blood for the forgiveness of your sins, you were not part of Jesus, and the language that he used was difficult, and it says that many walked away from him, even many who'd walked with him for years. Many of his disciples walked away and said, this is too much for us to bear. And Jesus turns to Peter, and we hear this interaction with Peter in John 6. He says this, from this time, many of the disciples turned back, and they no longer followed Jesus. And Jesus asked the twelve, you don't want to leave, do you? Do you want to leave as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. It is dangerous, but it's our only hope. The words of eternal life are in the words of God. The words that he's spoken through his prophets, the words laid out in his book. When you hear a message from the Lord in prayer, and you should ask for a message from the Lord in prayer. If it aligns with this book, it is the words of God. Trust it. It is our only hope. And it goes further than that. King David once said, I have hidden your word in your heart, my heart that I might not sin against you. The best hope that we might not sin against God is by hiding his word in our heart. If we aren't people in the book, we've got no hope. The word of God is active and alive. It is our foundation. And that's where we start. So as we visit, or revisit our foundation, looking at the words of God spoken to us, revealed to us, gifted to us by the one called the word of God, we must fall upon it we too will grow in a crooked direction. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Your words come in many ways, God, we know that. We praise you that we live in one of the lands and in one of the places where we have copies of it. Multiple copies of it. In this room, there are hundreds of copies of your word. There may be more copies of your word represented in this room than there are in the whole nation of China. So God, we thank you. We thank you that we've seen it. We thank you that you've been good to us and that you've given it to us. Help us to be good stewards of it. Help us to have ears that hear your word that comes through prayer. Help us to hear your messages that you speak to us through your spirit. Help us to have discernment, Father, to discern the spirits, to know is this the Lord speaking or the liar? Help us to hunger and thirst for your message. We need your word. Help us to truly be people of the book. God, so that we can stand and live and be fruitful. So that we might not sin against you, but most of all, so that you might be rightly declared the king of glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The last hymn we'll sing today in celebration is hymn number 353, Grace Greater Than Our Sin.
that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Each of us deserves the condemnation and wrath of God. But there is a grace that is greater than all our sin, and we would have never heard of it had it not been for the word of God. Let's go and be the people of the book for his glory. Have a good day, guys. Welcome his blessings. Thank you.